Welcome to Elan Restoration Fellowship, where Jesus is King, Hamelech, Lord, Hashem, and Messiah, Mashiach. And now, Pastor and Rabbi, Billy Elias. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Bearing the Burdens, here on Bearing the Burden podcast, sponsored by Elan Restoration Fellowship. I am your host, Pastor and Rabbi Billy Elias. So today we are going to begin, I, I guess it's going to be more of a classroom series, I guess you, you would say. Not, not necessarily a lecture type. Well, I mean, that's what sermons are anyway, right? A lectures. But I have been very impressed as of late um, in studying persecution. Um, I know, especially today, you know, it's all about the persecution of righteousness, the persecution of the gospel, the persecution of the church, uh, but, you know, and the persecution, there's lots of persecutions, but of course, still to this day, the persecution of Israel and things Jewish. And I, I've been reading a lot, um, and studying a lot about how, since the foundation of organized Christianity, how things have changed. So, and and, and I wonder, you know, we, we have a lot of theologians now, a lot of rabbis, you know, a lot of um, very educated men and women that are kind of now setting the record straight with the root of Christianity, of course, being Judaism, but not only that, being the Torah and, and of course, the Tanakh, the, the, the Old Covenant. And I, I wondered, and I, and I wanted to know, how did this happen? How did it change? How did it go from early believers, you know, in Acts that were called the way, early believers worshiping in synagogues to worshiping in churches to becoming very anti-Semitic. And we've spoken uh, on this podcast about King James, his um, rendition of the Bible, his version of the Bible, but why things were changed and why they deviated from the original text with the way he was raised and with what he experienced as a child and what the climate was during the time that he was the sixth king of Scotland, the first king of Scotland and England, King James I. So there was a lot of history. And as I've gone back, I've started to see that with the formation of organized Christianity in the Roman Empire, there was an issue that began almost right away. You know, we have the Council of Nicaea. We have the Council at Hampton Court. We have the Council of Trent. And in all these things over 13, 14, well, 1600 years, 1700 years, these things have changed Christianity, so what we have today is a result of what happened with, the, again, when the church come, came into existence through the Roman Empire. And of course, they were strongly influenced by Greek and Roman conceptions of culture of religion, of theology, and of course, of worship. Um, there's a book that I have read, and I'm reading it over again. It's called Every Day Remembrance Day, a chronicle of Jewish martyrdom, and it's written by Simon Weisenthal. Um, Simon Weisenthal uh, is a, he survived the Nazi concentration camps and, and um, he wrote this book and as a way uh, for Jews to realize 
This is what's happened and this is why it can never happen again. And in the book, he writes that there are six factors of persecution. The first one is hatred. The second one is dictatorship. The third one, bureaucracy. The fourth is technology. The five is the crisis of war. And number six is the minority as the scapegoat. And over the next several weeks, we are going to journey into those six categories and we are going to discuss certain dates and we're going to discuss certain persecutions that not only affected how Judaism was seen towards the end of the reign of the Roman Empire, um, but also why it was seen the way it was at the foundation of organized Christianity in Roman Empire and over the next thousand years there were multiple events that transformed theology and, um, because of certain things that would happen. So before we get into this, I want to I wanna just, um, today I just want to do a brief introduction to what this is going to be about. You're going to hear um, several terms that I think is important that we understand as we go ahead over the next several weeks. The first term is, you know, this term came into popularity in March of 1144 AD, Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. And it is called a blood libel. Now this is interesting because this is the accusation that Jews used blood of Christians in, rel in religious ceremonies, but mostly that they would use the blood of Christian children that they had killed in the preparation of the matzah for the Passover. This, it's called the blood libel again, in 1144 was proclaimed by a Catholic priest and it became widespread that if a child went missing in a village and was found dead, the nearby Jews would be sought out, hunted down, and they would be killed. The second, which I think is important, is called the Black Death Persecution. Now, as we talked about um, the six factors of persecution, one of them being disease, one of them being um, the, the, the lowest economical, uh, you know, peoples in a town, in a city, in a kingdom. Um, and of course, when disease and plague and troubles would hit the land, somebody needed to be blamed. So during the spread of the Black Plague in Europe, for thousands of years. The first people that were going to be blamed were the Jews. Jewish communities were being accused of causing the Black Death, either by poisoning the food that they harvested and sold to Christians, or by poisoning the water wells. You can imagine, and again, this accusation, the Black Death persecution was handed down by a Pope at the time, and we're gonna get into all of that, but you can imagine at that moment, the reaction of people in Christianity who were faithful to the church and faithful to those who were in charge of the church. So when the Black, Black Death persecutions began, entire Jewish communities were burned. The, the men were put on, uh, burned at the stake. Um, some were even crucified. And of course they would kill all women and all children within that village. 
because they were being told by the church that by doing this, the plague would vanish. There is something else that is very important that everybody knows, but you don't know. Right now, I, I, I don't know who you are, and I, I confess for myself, though I am a believer in Jesus as our glorious Messiah, there have been times when I have said some naughty words. And I'm sure if everybody's being honest, they've said some naughty words, not everybody. But one of the biggest words that you hear, which always makes people laugh, especially in the context, is the word bull. You, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, now, the funny thing about this word is it developed in England during the times of um, King Henry VI. I believe it was King Henry VI that began the Protestant Reformation. They didn't like the Catholic Church, so they started to reject Catholicism in England. But it, it wasn't made official, of course, till King Henry VIII because he wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragorn. But that being said, whenever a proclamation was handed down by a pope, it would be called a bull, like, you know, a B-U-L-L, -L, like the animal. So what it was, was a, a, it's a written, a, a written commission that was issued by the pope granting a privilege um, or issuing an instruction of some kind, and it was called a papal bull. Well, when it was handed down, and those living in England and those who adopted an anti-Catholicism mindset would say, oh, we've got another papal bull with the S word, and then, oh, did you see the latest bull S word? So that's where it came from, in case anybody was wondering. However, what's interesting here is the Bull Proclamation, um, which was handed down right around 1096, fueled the very first Crusades um, that was led by France. And it was it was it was sanctioned, and and permission was granted with written proclamation by the Pope at the time, which is Peter the Hermit. And the Holy Roman Empire at that time, so all of those nations that followed Catholicism were called to join in a purification of the Holy Land. So it wasn't just the Holy Roman Empire, but the Byzantine Empire as well were called by Catholicism and the Pope Peter the Hermit to go into the Holy Land and cleanse it of not only Jews, but Muslims as well. Well, one of the things that began to happen was they, the, the theology and the doctrine of this thing that the Jews were Christ killers started to emerge. It was never really a doctrine that was celebrated. It wasn't a doctrine that was recognized before the foundation of organized Christianity in the, and of course the Holy, the, well, the, the Roman Empire. Um, but it started right around between 1000 and 1100 AD, where the idea that it was the Jew that killed the Messiah, and of course forsaking what Paul had written, that it was Jesus who was obedient to his cross and his calling, that allowed himself to be persecuted, that allowed himself to be crucified. So with that letter from Paul and, and, and that scripture in mind, it was changed because there were things happening politically within the Holy Roman Empire. There were, there were shortages, there were droughts, 
there were plagues, there were things that were happening that needed to, or, or let's just say that the Holy Roman Empire was fracturing. So in order to keep it together, in order to hold the empire together, the Pope Peter decided that they needed an enemy and what enemy better than the Jew and to let the people know, well, this is why the Jew has become our enemy, not only because they were Jews, but because they had become Christ killers. And I bring up this papal um, bull because about 200 years later in 1207 AD, there was a Dominican priest, Dominic Guzman, Okay, he was the wandering Catholic preacher, as he was known. Um, he adopted an apostolic, uh, uh, yeah, apostolic lifestyle, in which he would go from town to town, um, and he would preach repentance. Um, his zeal, which he felt like from the Lord to do, was he, his job was to battle what's called the Cathars or Catharism. Um, in, a, a, and get it out of Orthodox Christianity because, well, I should say it was unorthodox Christianity and he wanted to set the record straight. So, um, Catharism was a dual belief in Gnosticism and Christianity and it started in French and it had spread to Spain. And they had believed in two gods. There was the evil god Hashem, God himself, was the evil God of the Old Testament, and then there was the good God, Jesus, the God of the New Testament. Now, one of the things that we have to understand is when we go all the way back, when the persecution started to begin, it happened in Spain. So in 1217, papal dispensation was given to authorize what had become known as the Dominican Order. You see, and the Dominican Order were the very first inquisitioners that were ordained by the Holy Catholic Church. So these are the things that started this persecution that obviously not only changed the way that European culture would deal with Judaism, but it really did change the way Christianity would be perceived and how doctrines would be changed and doctrines would just be set aside to meet a political agenda, to meet a spiritual agenda, and to meet, you know, the, the ability to come together against one enemy. Now, I want to leave this um, podcast with the following quote from Simon Weisenthal's um, book. He writes this, which really breaks my heart when I wrote, read it. Um, and I think it's important that we all understand the mindset of Judaism today and their lack of distrust when it comes to Christianity. Because he writes, the story of the persecution of the Jews has always been directed by Christians. First of all, by Roman Catholic Church and then by the Orthodox Church. These churches plunder the Bible, the most precious element of Jewish life, the unique treasures of Jewish identity, and use it for their own ends. So I end with this. What is in your heart? How do you identify? Identify as a Christian, a believer in the Messiah, of course. If so, do you accept the Jewish side of the Messiah? When you read the word of God, when you read 
the Tanakh. How do you use it? Is it just for stories? Or do you treasure it as something that's unique? And something that God breathed into existence through men so that we might have better insight into who he is? Or do you simply view it as an old book that Jesus used but is no longer necessary, but when we do use it, we use it to our own end? We take what's good out of it and we leave the rest behind. So I want to thank you for being a part of this podcast today. And, and again, I know it was a little scatterbrained, so forgive me, but over the next several weeks, we are going to dig deep into the persecution of the Jews and how it has changed Christianity today. And as always, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you shalom peace. In the precious name of Jesus, our glorious Messiah, we pray. You've been listening to Pastor and Rabbi Billy Elias. Pastor Billy is the founder and pastor of Elon Restoration Fellowship in Toms River, New Jersey. Join us again as Rabbi Billy bridges the gap between the Old and New Covenants. And as always, may the Lord bless you with peace.